right, so now it's time to talk about how can we teach the research. So I'm going to share with you kind of the overall model of how this works, and then we're going to actually be doing some activities here. So we're going to practice and try some of these out, and then hopefully you'll be able to take those and bring them into your classroom and use them there. And of course, this is not all of the approaches. There's many different options out there, but I'll share a couple of different ways that we can go about doing this with you. So the first thing is, is that we need to teach students about the different parts of a research article. So they, you know, they don't know that that little summary on the top called the abstract is really, really important. So one of the most um, important things that we can do is highlight the importance of that part of the article. And basically, as you know, in chapter one, it does a nice description of all the different elements of a research article so that they know what kind of information can be found in the abstract versus the introduction versus the method and results and discussion sections. And that's really one of our primary tasks, is to help them understand what kind of information goes into which parts. You know, it's not a novel. It shouldn't be read like a novel. You know, it's, it, it needs to be read in a very strategic way, so we have to give them some of the pointers. And one of the things I tell them about the abstract is that this is really the most important part of the article. In fact, if you don't get it from the abstract, it's only going to get worse, right? So we need to spend time on the abstract to really make sure that they understand the gist of it. Just like if you're going to the movies. Isn't it a lot easier to absorb the storyline if you've seen a preview, you know? Or if somebody told you a little bit about a book before you actually read the book, right? So having a little bit of a mental set before you move into the, you know, the whole story, the, the entire package, is really, really helpful for students. And the same thing, actually, for textbooks. I encourage students to read the chapter summary before the actual chapter because, again, you're getting a nice sneak preview and giving yourself a little bit of background knowledge on that topic. So the abstract's really important. We have to go through all the different parts of the um, research study, and as I said before, chapter one kind of outlines that pretty well. Here are the primary questions that are answered in each of the sections, and again, this is really the information that you find in the Exploring the Research Worksheets. Um, so you can see that those are outlined for you. There is a blank one in the very back of the book. Um, I also have an online copy for you um, that I could certainly post into our shared files kind of piece. So um, I forget what page it's on. I think it's like page 264. Um, and this is really what I want students to extract. This is the key findings from each of the different parts of the article. So I'll actually get kind of crazy and, I, and I'll have them, you know, kind of make sure they understand this. So if I had you um, folks as my introduction kind of section, you'd have to stand up and shout out, what's the question, right? So you, your job is really to find what the research question is if you're looking at the introduction. You know, why did they do this study? If you folks over here were my method folks in my class, I'd have you discover what does the method do, and you'd be like, who participated and what did they have to do? You know, and I'd actually have folks stand up and shout that out. And then folks over here, you'd be my results section, and you'd have to say, what's the answer to the question? And what I often would have them do is say, what was that question again? And then you would stand up and shout out the question to the article, and then you folks would have to answer it. Because what happens sometimes is, in the results section in particular, they get lost in all the data. So they're like, well, there were 29 females and 82 males. What was the question? Right now, not that that's not meaningful to know who the nature of your sample is, but you're really answering the who part over here, right? Who participated? Well, then you're going to say, well, the average GPA was a 3.1. Well, wait a minute. What was the research question? So that's giving you good data about the sample and what the study was about. But what your job as the research finders is, is to answer their question. What was the question? So I will oftentimes have students break up into different groups and B, the intro, the method, and the results folks. And that way they can kind of see what their job is, and they have to just fill out the answers to those questions, and they'll have to shout them out. Then what'll happen is they'll get really fancy schmancy on me, and they'll start giving me all jargony kinds of stuff. You know, well, the hypothesis and blah, 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 you know, they start going on. And I'll be like, put that down. What was the answer to their question? Was it yes or no? Maybe so. What was that? I don't want all the jargon. I want you to be able to simply tell me, did this make a difference? So in a minute, we're going to look at the Howard article that is on the value of a first year success course. And for that, for that particular, you know, article, they want to know. 
was it valuable, right? <laughs> so I would ask my results group to say yes or no. And then they would have to, you know, there's several different parts of that question, really. Was it valuable in terms of career? Was it valuable in terms of campus resources? Was it valuable in terms of study skills? And then they would have to answer simply yes or no to all those questions. Now, we don't stop there, but that really simplifies the process, right? When you really are just answering those very simple questions. Then we can dive into some more of the content. All right, comments, questions, or reactions so far? Well, reaction, thinking about the students that I work with, I'm sure a lot of the students, it makes it alive, something that would be very dry and boring, wordy, I can't get the X and the P and the equal. So you're making it almost like a detective story. That's right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And also, by not having them use the verbiage, um, you're, in a very subtle way, introducing the whole idea of plagiarism and using your own words without doing it in a forceful or topical way. You know, you're, you're giving students the um, confidence to use their own words, which is, in the end, really what we want to do. And really is one of the most powerful ways to learn, right? Because reading or copying they're pretty low-level cognitive tasks, right? And the reason that students often do that is because they don't get it. You know, I mean, when you don't understand something, it's hard to put it into your own words. So what we're doing is trying to simplify the process. And sometimes the answer's even in the title of the article, right? So I tell them, go back to the title, go back to the abstract, then go to your section, whether it's the results or whatever. And let's look and see, can we find out the answer right now to that question? Now, we may want to know more. We might be like, hmm, that's fascinating. I wonder why the answer was no or yes or maybe so. And then that's when we get to dive into it a little bit more. So I think that that's really kind of the neat part about it is we take this really scary, you know, overwhelming kind of task and we break it down so that it's not so scary and overwhelming and can be very manageable and very doable. It's building their confidence. So the other skill that you want to teach them, again, is remember I told you reading a scholarly article is not like you don't start on the first page and just keep going. I mean, that's not how I read articles. Um, and that's not how most professionals read articles. But students don't know that. They think they're supposed to start on page one of everything and proceed forward. So what we want to do is help them understand the nature of how to read the article. So as I said before, the abstract is key. You want to read it like five, 10, 15, 20 times, you know, as many times as it takes to get the gist of the article. You always start. And because it's often in italics, students often skip it. So we have to kind of draw their attention to that and why it's so valuable. The next thing you're going to do after you read the abstract is you're going to shift over to the introduction. Because the introduction really sets the stage for the article, right? It's, it provides you with background information about this topic, and then it also gives you information about the, the question. Thank you, Deb. <laughs> See? She's got her role already. Right? It's going to help you know what the question is. Why did they do this study? What do they want to know? Now, you might think that we're going to shift over to the method group next, but no, 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 because that's more complicated. You might think we want to shift over to the results section next, but no, 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 no. I don't go there yet either, because those are the most difficult sections of the article to read. So what we do is I tell students to skip all the way to the discussion, which is the last section. Again, why? The intro and the discussion are the easiest parts to read, and the discussion will tell you the answer to that question without all the statistics and without all the details. So it'll be more captured in the context of what we know about that topic. So it's a lot easier for students to grasp. So helping them see the nature of how you read an article is really powerful. Once they've done that, then they have to go back to the beginning and start over and read the entire package. So what we have done for students by giving them this approach is really given them background knowledge to take in the tougher parts of the article. So it's really important for them to know how to read scholarly articles. All right, so now it's time to talk about the approach and what we can do <laughs> Excuse me, to uh, you know, help them really learn about it. I don't ask them to do an activity independently for the, probably the first month, month and a half or so of the semester. 
I'm doing a lot of together activities with them. So we will work on articles together. We're going to do them in class. You know, I might ask you to preview it at home, but I'm not asking you to master it at home yet. So it's really just kind of get yourself familiar with it before you get to class, and then during class we're going to work together. So we're going to actually read the different parts, go through the, you know, together we'll look at the intro and try to figure out what the question is. Together we'll figure out who participated and what they had to do. Together we'll figure out what the answer to the question is. And together we'll figure out why do we care? You know, what's the value of this? And how can you apply this to your, to your personal world or to college in general? Because all the articles are related to student success, of course. And then I'll use PowerPoint slides that will then break down the article. And you have all the PowerPoint slides that go with the textbook, so you already have my breakdown of the articles that you can just use. If you want to modify them in any way, you certainly can. They're all on the Instructor Companion site, and if you have any trouble locating them, just reach out to me, and I'll make sure that you um, are you know, connected to them. So again, we start off together. <laughs> After we um, do some together things, then I might have students actually kind of work in groups where I'm not necessarily giving them everything to start off with, but now together they're working at, at a table to figure out, okay, let's fill out the intro together, let's fill out the method, let's fill out the results together. And I certainly would be coming around as a support person, checking in. Um, so now you're having students work a little bit more independently, but with the support of their peers, and then eventually we'll be moving down the, the road to their, their more independent work in, with uh, journal articles. So let's try this. We're going to do an activity, and this is the abstract only activity. So if you can, turn to the first article in chapter one, which is starting on page 35. And this is the Howard article. So this is the first article that students are exposed to. And what I do with this approach, and I know some others, and Charlotte, you've used this approach before too, and some others have done it as well, um, is I will show them how valuable the abstract is through a simulation exercise. Instead of me just saying, this is an important paragraph, I show them how important it is. So I'm going to give out to you the Exploring the Research Worksheets. And I'm going to ask you to all independently, because I, in my class I would first go you know, through it together, but I know you folks can do this probably independently. Don't put your names on this. We're actually going to do a peer review exercise with this in a minute too. But what I'd like you to do is only use the abstract, nothing but the abstract, and try to fill out as many answers to the questions as you can. So again, we're only using the abstracts and we're trying to answer all the questions. Now there might be, they have to put a question mark because you don't know, it's not answered in the abstract. So just put as much information as you have. Okay, so now let me ask you a question. How many of you were able to put some kind of information into every question based on just reading the abstract? All right, so just, I mean, it looks like everyone really was able to. So you see how students will immediately see the value of the abstract by just having them do the abstract. Now, one of the things that you could do next is you could then ask them to dive into the actual article and find out some more details. Maybe you plant some questions, you know. Um, for example, what were you able to tell me about who participated based on the abstract alone? Who participated? 118. So now, were they first year students? So they were freshmen. So you were able to tell that. Do we know what kind of class they were taking? Okay. So, it, so you, can, you can find out some of the information. Now sometimes you'll get just that there were 118 undergraduates. And you may not know whether they were first year students, seniors. You know, so in order to get that level of detail, you might need to go into the actual method section, right? Now, what did those participants have to do? A pre and post test. Do we know a lot about what that pre and post test was about? Not so much. So in order for us to find out more about what the nature of that pre and post test is, we're going to have to dive into the method. So I don't want students to think that they can get everything that they need from the abstract because that's not the message that we want them to walk away with, but that it's a great starting point and you really get the general context of it. So then what you can do as a faculty member is to ask some pointed questions and ask them at their tables to work with a team member in, in class and find and go on that detective hunt that you mentioned before and dive into that article and find the answer to the questions that you pose. Or you can have them generate the questions. What else do you want to know based on what you read so far? 
Maybe they'll come up with, well, I want to know who these students were. I want to know what that pre and post test looked like. I want to know how big of a difference it would make. You know, I mean, so those are some of the questions that your students might even pose and then have them hunt for those answers. And that's even more meaningful. So that's kind of a neat way to get them involved in the article. Again, it's a pretty low stakes because I don't really grade this. You know, this is more of a learning exercise. And I'll do this several times with different articles to really get them exposed to the content before it's time for them to go and read articles on their own and use them in their own papers and presentations. So now I want to move into another process called the peer review process. So what we're going to do is we're going to pretend that these, well, these are your own individual work, but you can do this one, one of two ways. You could have them work in class like I just did for you, or you could have them, maybe this is the next level, and you have them try to do this on their own with a new article, and they bring that to class. You know, I know that we're using in our syllabus, um, you know, one of the first writing assignments is for them to actually do and exploring the uh, research worksheet for one of the articles. So you could have them bring in their assignment. I tell them to bring it in with no name attached so we can do this anonymous peer review process. Now, if you've ever done peer review before, it's a great concept, but it often really backfires and becomes a mess because students don't know how to give each other feedback. They don't feel confident with their own skill set to give feedback, and it often can actually waste class time and be non-productive instead of being productive. So what I'm going to share with you is an approach that Facey talked about in an article she wrote that's kind of the conveyor built um, kind of model of peer review. And instead of me saying, you know, swap papers and give feedback to your peer, which is very vague, not very clear, you're kind of lost. And what people usually do is they don't write anything because they don't know what to write. So instead of doing that vague approach, this is a very structured way to do peer review feedback. So here's what I would do. I would take different categories um, you know, of feedback. And I just threw out you know, four different categories here. We have three groups today, so we'll just go through di three different types. But let's say your job was to determine how accurate the question and answer part was. So the only thing, let's pretend I'll give this assignment to this table over here. When I give you different papers to look at, your job is basically going to be, did they identify the research question accurately, like is it what you thought it was, is it not, is it different? And if it's different than what you thought, you'd, what you'll write is, I thought it was this. And then you'll also go back and you'll talk, you know, I do this in groups. So well, what did you think it was? Let's all make sure we're kind of consistent here. And clearly I'll be coming over as a professor to check in and answer questions. So if Deb says to me, well, they wrote this, but I really thought this was the question. What is it? I'm going to help them and look at it and dive into the intro. And let's say, let's take a look, closer look at this paragraph. I'm going to come back in a few minutes and check and see where you're at you know, as a table on this. So basically, your only task is to see, did they get the question and did they answer that question? Okay? So that would be your only task. You don't have to worry about the method and the discussion and all the other pieces. You know, another group might have the method. So if you were the method group, I might say to you, did your folks who answered your paper, did they give enough detail? Did they give you the specifics about who these students were? Was there anything that they left out that they should have added? Did they tell you how the study was done? You know, did they just say pre and post test and we don't know what the test is on? Did they just say there were 100 and whatever, 18 students, but they didn't say the nature of who these students were? Were they all males? Were they all females? What kind of university are we talking about? You know, what was the nature in terms of demographics of these students? So could they have added more detail to that? Did they answer it comprehensively? That's your only task. Okay, and then another group could be um, the application. So, did they talk about the value in a you know comprehensive way? Did they make connections between this and maybe other content that we've talked about in the class? Did they identify some specific ways that this could be useful? And then you could have another group that talked about writing skills and did they cite it appropriately? Was APA style used correctly? You know, so you and you could come up with more. You know, so I'm just giving you a sample of them for today to give you the idea. So the idea is now as a peer reviewer, you only have one thing you're looking at. And then what happens is, is you pass the papers around so that by the time it's done, you are getting your piece of paper back with three or four different types of feedback on it that are all specific from your peers. So this means you don't have to necessarily grade everything all the time and give them feedback. You can be there to make sure they're giving good feedback. You're monitoring the process. You're training each group you know, for a few minutes. It doesn't need an hour training or anything on what your task is. You're going over to them. You're having them work together in teams to do it. So I want to just kind of model that for a minute. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, take your papers and pass them over here. 
So I'm going to have you folks, you're going to be the, the um, I'll have you be the research question and answer group. I'm going to give you a new set. I'm going to take your papers over here, move them this way. I'm going to have you folks be the method group. So your job is to look at the method. And you folks are going to be the application group. So you're going to take a look at the application. So just take a few minutes. You don't have to do every single piece of paper in front of you. You can work together. You can maybe pick one or two of them to do for sake of time today. In class, you'd actually have them all get feedback. But since we don't have a lot of time, you might want to just pick one or two of them, work together on your table on whether or not you think that person answered it appropriately, and then write some feedback down. Then I'll rotate you in a minute, and you'll get another batch of papers. OK? Questions at all about the process? All right. All right. Have fun. Yeah, the bottom. Yeah. So now what I what I just told the other group is what I do in my class is I'll actually have people work in pairs. I didn't have even numbers to do that today. Well I kind of do but you're split between tables and tables. So, so um, I would have two of you work on two papers together. And then that way it's not too many that you're giving feedback to and it doesn't take too much time. Okay, just for the sake of time, I'm going to have a stop, um, but I think you're starting to get the idea of how this works. So let me just tell you a little bit more about how I would do it in a classroom. So I basically would divide them into three teams, so to speak, right? And there, you know, or four, depending on how many types of feedback you want to give. But I usually do three or four because it gets too long if you do much more than that. And then what happens is um, I will have, within team one, I will have two students partner up. So you'll be kind of a partner, you'll be a partner with whoever's sitting there, you'll be a partner, you'll be a partner. And then each partner group would be working together on two pieces of paper to give feedback to. So there, it's not really like 20 people or 10 people are working together all in one big group because that doesn't work so well. I find that the pairs work better, but that these 10 people over here would be doing the question answer part. So I would kind of talk to them as a whole group about what their job was for the question and answer. You might even want to give them a very specific handout, especially if they're doing it for the first time, with some clear instructions about what that group's job is. And then you would have them work in teams, and they would write feedback on each one. And the same thing for the other teams. Then those papers would rotate to the next team, so that by the time they get back to the original owners, they should have three to four pieces of feedback on them. And then I usually do not grade their paper until they have a chance to revise it based on the peer feedback. So sometimes I don't tell them that they're doing the peer feedback because I want to make sure they're giving me a good final copy, not just a draft copy. So then I'll surprise them and I'll be like, OK, we just did that. Um, so now, as you know, your papers are due. And they'll be like, what? I want to be able to do it again. I'm like, you do? Go for it. Do it again. And next week, well, I'll collect them. So I want you to benefit from the peer feedback process. So you can either tell them that you're doing this peer feedback, or you can kind of surprise them with that activity and say, you know, I really care about you getting feedback and doing the best you can. And you can, you know, tuck in chapter six and self-reflection. And you can self-reflect on it. Because many students will look at someone else's paper. And even if they don't get any paper back themselves, they're like, oh, that's what a good one looks like, you know, because mine doesn't look like that one. I only wrote a sentence, and they had like a very clear paragraph. Um, or maybe someone wrote a whole bunch, but I don't know what they said. It was very jargony, and they didn't really extract it and put it into their own words. So it might be the your own words police, you know, could be one of the tables, you know. Did you put in your own words? Are you saying too much? Yeah. Are you using too much jargon and terminology from the text? So you can be creative with what kind of feedback you think your students would benefit from. And it's a great opportunity for them to really engage in reflection. And they have really found it to be very helpful. And you could obviously do it with all different kinds of assignments, not just this one, but you can see how this is going to help them really elevate their game in terms of understanding the research. So any comments, questions, or reactions to the peer review um, idea here? Certainly the concept of seeing the models of what someone else did well is really helpful, really beneficial to a lot of students. I think that they did what they were supposed to do, just not enough or not full enough or not. Mm -hmm. Now think about it. So that means as a student, you are seeing at least six other papers, right? Because you're going to have at least probably three teams, and you're working with someone else. So that means you're going to have two, four, six opportunities to see six classmates' papers anonymously with no names. 
in addition to getting feedback on your own paper. So there's lots of different kinds of feedback that they're getting, which is really powerful. And it's their peers, so they know their peer can do what they can do. That's right, that's right, that's right, absolutely. They can do it, I can do it too, absolutely. All right, so then after I, after I would do something like that, then I, then I would want to go over it as a class, you know, going through the PowerPoint slides and making sure that we kind of all are on the same page and we all kind of got the key points of the study. So I'm just going to go through this article um, quickly. As you know, this is the Howard article, and it's all focused on whether or not um, the first year experience course is effective. And the primary research question, so they can kind of match it up again with my model. And all these PowerPoint slides are you know, in with the textbook material, so you have access to them as well. So I would basically say, here's the research question. And here's how they did the study. So they had the pre-test, the post-test. And we would talk as a class a little bit more about the nature, what kinds of questions, and why was it a good idea that they used GPA? Did they ask the students what their GPA was, or did they actually get it from the registrar's office? Why would that matter? How could that impact the results? Things of that nature. So we would dive in and go into the article and look for those kinds of um, pieces of information along the way. And then we talk about the results. And I try to capture these visually for students. So you'll see um, I have chart here. And we can see the answer was yes, it was beneficial for all areas. So in every area, there was significant improvement, with the exception of college major choice. So now it's time for critical thinking caps, right? We don't just leave it here and say, OK, we got it. We know that that's the case. We now got to explore the why, the how, what, what's going on with this study, right? So I would then ask students to let's take a look at this. So if we know that some of the things are, you know, here um, are working well, I would say, let's look in our textbook and see, why do we think it helps with study skills? Why do we think that it helps with the awareness of resources? What, is, what information in your text is going to help you build those skills? So I might put them on a hunt. I want you to find in that information in our textbook and how that's going to help you. And then I would say, well, wait a minute. We've got college major that's not working so much here. Why would that be? Is there any information in your textbook about careers? So I'm actually going to have you do this part for a minute. I want you to go in your textbook, and I want you to look for the career section, and I want you to, with a partner, discuss why this might go down instead of up at the end of the first semester, using information from the textbook rather than just your own ideas. We can use your own ideas too, but I first want you to look for textbook backed up information about why. So now they have to find, you have to use like the table of contents or the index or, you know, so now I'm going to have you do that. So just take a minute or two, look for the career section, and I want you to identify with a partner at least one reason why that might be the case. All right, so we're going to come back together again um, as a large group. So I saw that you were all exploring. I was kind of eavesdropping on your conversations. And lots of people were finding kind of different points to make about why this might be the case. Um, I'm going to ask, if you don't mind, Zoe, for you to share um, what you were talking about. Well, the sentence I found on page 242 that kind of Now look at that. It's not a good student. <laughs> the sentence I found on page 242 says yes. <laughs> it really sums it up. It's just career exploration takes time. Mm -hmm. that, you, that you having the extra year so college is not bad you're not it's not actually horrible. It's not horrible, right? So first of all, you have permission to not know right away. And second of all, I also heard many of you talking about all the different variables that go into deciding, you know, personality. I heard several of these things, you know, values, interests, abilities, crumble, happenstance, all that kind of stuff that goes into it. So what happens is that sometimes students are more overwhelmed and more confused. But that might be better. You know, if you look at the, there's a section in the book that talks about identity development and identity statuses. And you want to first explore before committing. And sometimes our students just commit so they think they know. And then they discover, oh, I don't really know. I didn't explore fully. So exploration before commitment helps you really kind of, like, you know, work through that identity process. And career is a big part of our identity process. So it's really not necessarily a bad thing that that happened. That might be a good outcome of the course if you're more confused at first, because maybe you're really more thinking about it in a much more comprehensive way. So the idea here is, as you can see, how one article all of a sudden turns a textbook into a resource. 
right? And you could do the same thing with the positive findings. Why do you think the study skills would work? What evidence can you find that would show you that this course would help you with campus resources? You know, what evidence is it going to build your confidence? What's the term for confidence that, that we use in the textbook? You know, help them go find that self-efficacy, you know, kind of terminology. So you can take an article and then really use it. So I love this article in particular because it's a great one for bouncing off in lots of different directions. You don't have to wait till the end of the semester to deal with careers. You're starting to, you know, kind of bounce around and touch lots of different topics very early on. All right, any questions about this before we shift to a different um, strategy? All right, so um, another approach is prediction. And I love prediction because it really gets students excited because students want to be right. You know, it kind of goes back to that detective kind of, uh, you know, model that you were using before. And I really think that this works really well. So what you can do is you can introduce the study, but don't give away the results. And then there's two things you can do. Either A, have their attention in class, which is always a wonderful thing because they want to know whether they were right or not, or B, send them off on their merry way to find out at home and increase the likelihood of them actually reading the text because they have to come back to class maybe with a you know, ticket into the class or something that says whether or not they were right. You know, have their prediction on the card and then they have to say whether or not they were right and where they got that information from. So one of the ones I like to use for this is the um, same uh, uh, Weston and Sapita article, which is on multitasking, because students don't always see this. <laughs> so their predictions aren't always on target. Um, and I think it's uh, a little bit more compelling sometimes when they're not right. You know, so they're, oh. You know, and that usually promotes more critical thinking, because when they think they're right, they're more likely to kind of look at, at different angles and break apart the study. Well, they didn't really do it in this way. They should have had more people in the study. How can you possibly base it off of this many? So then I'm like sending them on the information literacy hunt, right? Well, go and see if there's another study out there that supports your point of view. Is all the literature consistent? Or is there kind of a smattering of some say this and some say that? You know, that's, and that's kind of another big important message for them is that one study doesn't tell the whole story, right? You need consistency across many different studies that are going to be pretty powerful. So for this one, here are the questions that are the research prediction questions. I would basically ask the students, I might ask one at a time. You can do it in a variety of ways. You know, the good old fashioned, raise your hand if you think yes, raise your hand if you think no. You can do the more advanced way, like poll everywhere kind of clicker things on their phone. Um, everybody vote and tally in, and then you get kind of the graph of you know, who predicted what. And then before you even give them more information about the study, you could then ask them, on what are you basing your prediction? So now you're starting to challenge their thinking process a little bit. Well, I know I'm able to text and still listen to you at the same time. I know I can just check my Facebook real fast, and that's not going to do anything. I can still listen. So I've had success. I still got an A in a class where I did that. So they might use their own personal experience, which is fine, but it's not as significant as some of the other kinds of information that you might base your decision on, right, your prediction. So we have a conversation about that before we move on. And then we'll go through the study. Um, so now you folks know the answers. So I can't really do the prediction with you because <laughs> um, I think you know all the answers. But put yourself in the student role for a minute. How many of you think your students would say yes to the first question? So multitasking is going to negatively impact me personally. Anybody think their students would say yes? Couple? All right. How many of you think your students would say yes to the second one that it's going to negatively impact other people? Yeah, so some of them haven't thought of it. Um, I would say some students are getting the message that multi, they know it's not great. So I think many, you know, some students do say, yeah, I know it's probably not good for me and I probably missed something when I was checking my, you know, whatever, my social media site. So I think some of them would, but not all of them. We're not going to probably get 100%. And the second one, I think, I like, no. In fact, if you ask them a different question, how many of you are negatively impacted by someone else in the class using social media, they're going to say, no, it doesn't bother me. I don't, you know, I can tune that stuff out. <laughs> That's not going to bother me at all. So anyway, you get them engaged with the prediction, and then you can either jump right into it, or you can give it to them as homework and then pick up on it at the beginning of next class. Um, either way, whatever way you want to work with it. Um, and then you basically kind of tell them about how the study was set up and how folks were randomly assigned to either take notes without multitasking or whether in, they were in the multitasking section. Um, 
And you know, then they also had the second study where you could either see people multitasking or you couldn't see people multitasking. So they had two different studies within this particular article. And the answer to the question was yes and yes. It did negatively impact performance, not only of the student, but also the other students sitting near them. And <laughs> here's the test performance for the folks who were multitasking versus single tasking. So you can see by single tasking, you were going to really outperform the multitasking group. So this is a pretty significant difference. And if you were watching other people, you also were not going to perform as well as people who didn't have that distraction. So again, these visual graphs can be kind of powerful images for students to kind of take away. And here's just an image of what it looks like, you know, like if, there, if you were in the view of a multitasker or you weren't. So it was somebody really pretty much next to you or in your eyesight. Um, so this is a great, you know, the prediction strategy works wonderful. My students like it a lot. And I think your students will like it too. And I know many of you are using it. And then you want to take that and turn it into a conversation. So if we, you know, now they're going to be like, you know, that can't be possible. And then where's your evidence? Go find a study. You go find a study that shows that it doesn't impact you negatively. Let's go right now. Log into the library databases. You know, let's go, team. You know, like we're gonna, you know, turn on your little Wi-Fi devices and we're gonna search. Let's see. Or find another article that supports this. Let's see. Is this a single isolated finding or is this a consistent finding? You seem like you don't agree with it. Well, let's go look at the late literature. It's time to dive into the databases. So now I would have them working in teams, just doing that right then and there, instead of them just saying, well, I think it's not true. Well, find the evidence, you know, going more for that information literacy approach. Comments, questions, or reactions to the prediction? It just occurs, because I've been trying to sit here thinking about how to do this online. Yeah. But prediction yeah. would work if it was, if you lead into that earlier and then come back later. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that, I'm going to give that a try. You could in a discussion board. Yep. Not, you may not want to use a textbook article. You may want to use another article that they don't have access to that they have, that maybe not even give the whole citation. But here's the study. And then ask them what are they basing that on. And then ask them to read the study. And now talk about how their points of view might have changed. If so, how, why, if not, on what basis, you know. So you could kind of do that in a series of assignments online. Excellent. Great. Anybody else? Any other comments or questions about that? Okay. Well, the last thing that I want to talk about in terms of the research approach, and then we're going to talk about some other pieces of the, the text and some other active learning strategies is, is that once you've given them all these kinds of activities, the research prediction, the abstract only, the peer review, all of that, they are going to feel more and more self-confidence and higher levels of self-efficacy at being able to read and use articles. So now they're at a place where they can start to really go and find those articles, and that's where we would go and meet with the librarians. They can help you teach your students how to do this, and you can help them go. I mean, there's search tools in the textbook. You know, there's a lot of tips in there about how to search effectively. And then they're going to be able to start to find their own articles. I do think that you still need to be a very big support, and you'll need to tell them I need to tell my students anyway that I still want to approve any articles that are going to be used in our class for whether it's a presentation, a paper, a project, whatever it might be. And the reason is, is because sometimes they pick really challenging articles. I have to tell you to find the short, manageable articles is probably the most difficult part. But they need to learn that skill because in their other classes, their faculty aren't going to just hand deliver the articles for them. They're going to have to find the information that they need. And they need to navigate that world of the databases. So. We want them to develop the skill set, but we want to scaffold them along the way. So I will often have them bring in multiple you know, versions of different articles and help them choose the one that's going to be the most manageable for them at this point. And then as they progress, they'll get better and better at able to, being able to read them and use them. So that's kind of the, the research approach. So any questions about the research piece of it?